morning, everyone. Thank you for having me and being here. Um, so I'm going to talk about imagining government beyond uh, the nation state. Let me see if my... OK, so um, I'm not seeing the slides here. OK. Um, so I'd like to start with um, a fable by Aesop, um, this Greek wrote, writer who said that um, there was a fox that was trying to jump and get some grapes. You know, and the fox was very little, and he tried to jump, and he couldn't see them, and he tried to jump, and he couldn't get them. And at the end of it, he's like, you know what? That's it. I'm walking away. Those grapes are sour anyway, without even trying them. And you know what? We are the fox. We've essentially internalized the idea that we are bound by the political institutions that we've inherited. That the, this type of democracy is the democracy that we have. And this is the democracy that we have to live with. And what we are is we are 21st century citizens that we are living with 19th century design institutions that are conceived with an information technology of the 15th century. This is us. This is us being the fox. So, but it seems to me like the, that the nation states, as a structure, as the only structure that organizes our governance, might not be around forever. Um, they might not be the only jurisdiction that where democracy fundamentally takes place. It is a framework that it's going to change. And I think that and what I'm going to try to argue today is that the nation state's core monopolies are being challenged left, right, and center. And I'm going to argue how that's affecting our democracies and what can we do? What's coming next? next and you know, an idea of what can we do about it. So the nation states do have the monopolies over our bodies. They have the monopolies over the land. But one of the things, one of the core capabilities from the nation states that are being challenged is their right to give us an identity, to tell us that we are someone in the world. Because to this map, we can juxtapose this map. Right? Corporations are challenging the nation state's monopoly on telling us that we are someone. They are trying to control our minds and challenging the states by doing it. The second thing that the nation states are um, losing is the monopoly on providing a currency. Right? Bitcoin started this big separation of money and state. And this has profound consequences. Think about it. For the first time, Having a currency is no longer an accident of birth. We can choose our currencies. The nation state is also being challenged as the only institutional actor, institutional global actor. And this was brought about, 45, as we are, no, like to name it these days, when he pulled out of the Paris Climate Accord. When the United States pulled out of the accord, a coalition of universities, cities, corporations was formed that did this parallel pledge and said, like, we don't care if the United States as a country, as the nation state decided not to go ahead with fighting climate change. We are doing it anyway. And so leadership in, in, in the fight against this huge issue is shifting from federal governments to lower levels of governments, academia, and industry. So these are profound changes that are happening at the nation state level. States are losing their monopoly on giving us an identity, of telling us that we're someone. Um, they're losing their monopoly on printing money, on giving us a way to transact value. And they're losing their monopoly as the global actor that, by excellence. So the question is, What's going to come next? In my opinion, what's coming next are our governance structures. Our political institutions are not designed in the void. They respond to a certain economic um, context. They respond to certain technology. They respond to a certain education, to a certain system of beliefs that we have in society. And they also shape a certain type of citizens. We are the consequence of the political institutions that we have. 
So hierarchical design institutions, which is the type of institutions that we have today, where a few speak in the name of the many, were the best system that we could come up with when we had an information technology that was essentially the printing press. But the way we had to communicate was physically moving from one place to another. And this, that we're, but we are still living with this type of political system. And just think about everything that changed in society. I'm, I'm not going to preach to this room about the effects that internet had in our lives, in our culture, in the way we share information, in the, way, in the access that we have. You know it. But the political institutions remained the same. They didn't change at all. And so, sorry, my argument is that this situation, where this, we are super out of society, is very out of sync with our political institutions, is generating two types of results. The first one is silence, apathy. The famous, people just don't care, right? And it's being thrown around everywhere, especially against millennials, which I absolutely disagree with. I don't think we're apathetic. I'm going to consider myself a millennial here. I don't think we are apathetic. I think we have a system that produces apathy. But it, it's not a bug in the system. It's a freaking feature. The system was designed right, for the conversation amongst the few. Right? The political system that we have is only concerned with the game between professional citizens our elected representatives. And everyone else is expected to go into their private lives and do their own thing. Come vote once every couple of years, say yay or nay, and then go back and make money, or try to. This is the system that we have. The other result that such a system is producing is a lot of noise. We are taking on the streets. There's protests. Of course, there are no viable channels for, to give input to government. So these, our political institutions simply cannot respond to the demands of a society that is radically changing. And part of the problem is that our liberal democracies are absolutely infatuated with the territory. They're organized around the territory. We are represented based on we are, where, we are happen to be, where we happen to be living at, or worse, I'm Argentinian, so in my case, I'm represented by where I was born, right? Um, but we are different now. Why are we still bound by the territory? And our only option is to be represented based on our physical um, standing. Um, so the problem with a system that produces silence or produces noise is that we are very much fighting it, or we try to fight it, we disagree with it. But the problem with that is that we need to build something instead. Because it's all great. We go up, we go, we protest, we fight, we don't like what we see. And trust me, reality is it's bad these days. <laughs> like, I get it. But what are we going to do instead? What do we want? Do we want to just get rid of what we have and then? So. Unless we have an honest conversation about what do we want to build, we are going to face a huge problem. We are going to generate power vacuums. And the thing with power dynamics is that they never stay empty. There is no really such thing as a power vacuum. It gets generate, generated and very quickly gets filled up. By who? By someone in the string, by the demagogues that get to play advertising with our emotions by the military in the worst cases. So if we are going to keep undermining our existing institutions, if we do not trust our existing institutions, we need to have a conversation about who do we trust. Because political action is not agitation. It's construction. Um, all right, so our two cents, my two cents to this conversation, and by all means, I don't have the answers to everything. I'm just asking the questions that I think we should be asked. I'm just telling you what I think we should be talking about. And this is not a solution that is going to you know, end up all of our problems. It's just an idea. It's called Democracy Earth. And it's not there. There it is. Um, so Democracy Earth is we build this open source social smart contract where we're discussing the type of democracy that we would like to see. 
And I'm going to talk a little bit about that now. And at the same time, we are building a protocol for experimenting and implementing that democracy. So the first question that we need to ask ourselves is who do we trust? If we do not trust our elected representatives, if we do not trust this, our representatives average between 0.003%, 0.001% of a population, fantastic. But democracy is a matter of trust. So we need to decide how we're gonna tr who are gonna, are, we are going to be trusting. And my suggestion is we should trust ourselves a little, a little bit more. So one of the core questions about governance is who gets to represent whom, right? Um, so our proposal is to implement a liquid democracy protocol where we can choose different people to represent us for different topics, right? So I can choose someone to represent me for matters regarding healthcare because I know that they are a doctor that's been working, he's been working or she's been working in the public healthcare um, system for 35 years. I trust, she, I trust her with my vote, right? Um, but I trust someone else for all matters regarding the economy, okay? So we can have a bottom-up dynamic representation that surfaces social leadership. That's called really good democracy. We can give ourselves an identity. This is Roma, she's my daughter. She's two and a half now. This was the, the day after she was born. And we, you know, the nation states are losing their, um, capability, their monopoly on giving us an identity, but that's going to the corporations, right? Facebook is trying to claim the right to give us an identity. But there's another way of doing it, that is the network providing their identity. Right, so what, when Roma was born, we registered her birth on the blockchain using a system called Proof of Existence before we registered her with the state of California. So it's not the states and it's not the corporations that are telling my daughter that she's someone in the world. We did that. The network is providing for that identity. So there is another way of doing it. Voting mechanism, who counts the votes? Right, this is another key part of uh, democracy. I come from a country where the ballots are burned after an election. Where we count the votes manually, I did this when I was running for elections myself, until two o'clock in the morning fighting with the other party, stacks of papers, like that. they're called sheet lists, like listas sabanas, like a sheet, they're that long, they're like a canvas. We have a better way of doing it. We can use technology, we can use the blockchain to um, register the votes and build an incorruptible ledger. No one is gonna tell us that the, the votes are not what they were, right? There's a far better way of doing this. What jurisdictions, that this is another key piece of democracy. Um, again, I'm from Argentina. Argentina represents me on all issues regarding in the international uh, arena. They vote for me in climate change issues, for example. But why can't, I don't know, Costa Rica represent me? They have a much more progressive energy policy. I trust them with my vote. Hell, I would give them money to push what they're doing everywhere in the world. But I can't. Why? Because I'm Argentinian. And we still live in a world designed for nation states. So what we did was, with Democracy Earth, we did, um, a digital referendum for Colombia. When Colombia voted the um, referendum for peace, seven million Colombians couldn't vote because they weren't in Colombia at the time. We're in the 21st century. This blows my mind. And so what we did was we, we grabbed the referendum for peace, we divided in many different clauses, and we asked them to vote in those different clauses. And the thing with referendums is that are a very blunt instrument of democracy. It normally gets boiled down to yes or no, for or against one issue, and everything else kind of pivots around that. But in this case, when we did it with Democracy Earth, we showed that most of the clauses, like 90% of the clauses were approved, except one, the one that actually prevented the referendum for peace to get approved, right? If the FARC were allowed to be part of government. We, they could have approved 90% of the, of the referendum instead of losing the whole battle because it's hinged on just one issue. So this is Democracy Earth. 
Obviously, we're experimenting. This is a learning process. Um, any group can give itself their governance institutions. We need to learn how to do this. We haven't done it for such a long time that we don't know how to be active participants, active citizens. Democracy Earth is built around these three issues that I discussed. Identity, peer-to-peer -peer validated identity with blockchain keys. Representation, it's global, it's dynamic, it's horizontal. It's called liquid democracy. And voting, the network stores the vote. It's a shared incorruptible ledger. So coming back to my um, Fox at the beginning, we are not bound by the political institutions we've inherited. We collectively own them. It's up to us to decide what democracy do we want, what governance structures do we want to build. And Buckminster Fuller said a phrase that I live by, you never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, build a new model that renders the existing model obsolete. So I urge you, every time you wake up in the morning and you just, like me, you feel just, you just want to go and fight reality, think about <laughs> what do we want to build instead? What do we want to replace it with? Because you know what? It's up to us, no one else. Thank you. <laughs> like, woo, chills. Like, you know, what do I want to build? I'm a little anxious now um, and excited. Thank you so much. That was amazing. Thank you. Um, so we're going to go into some Q&A. We're short a little bit, so we'll get to the coffee break after this. But yes, Sorry, I think I went um, over time. No, sorry. don't worry. Uh, don't worry. It was amazing, the <laughs> ending. Whew. So uh, Pia is going to be back in this room at 2.30 with Darshana, the facilitator for a workshop, and a bunch of folks from V Taiwan as well, uh, workshopping new ways of thinking about democracy and redesigning it. So uh, new approaches to democracy in the digital age. And I hear there's going to be some VR headsets maybe. So very exciting. Okay. Um, yeah, I know. Mm. So uh, anyways, let's go into some of the questions. We have one at the very top. So how should we re-examine our identity along nation state borders and when they also motivate us to pursue maybe more fair and just governance sometimes? Yeah, yeah. this is um, it's, it's a great question. Um, <laughs> Obviously, like with you know, all the changes that the internet brought about, it fractured the way we understand our identity. And so we need to rebuild those identities. Um, and what makes us part, I, I think we should see ourselves as peers of a commons, that we share one planet. And that's our primordial identity. We are all peers of the commons, and we share one planet. And we need to start there. Yeah, um, I, I saw there was a question by Jerry as well. Um, and so speaking of, we have this whole planet and the question of identity and belonging to the planet, but what about nations of choice, like Burning Man, for yeah, example? absolutely. Uh, what does that mean when we want to be part of smaller groups of people? Yeah, um, I don't have a, an answer to that. <laughs> I don't know. I think that um, um, what's exciting about the changes that are happening is that if we're not, if the nation state is no longer the structure where democracy takes place, that opens so many possibilities. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that it's going to go two ways. It's going to go up, as in like a global democracy, which is the type of projects that we are doing um, with issues that affect us all. Um, and again, the role there to really provide identity, provide a voting mechanism, provide um, a little bit of agency to mm -hmm. diasporas, forced migrations is so important today. So I think it's going to go up to that kind of level of the stack. And it's also going to go down to the cities and these type of communities mm -hmm. where face-to-face -face interactions or at least more um, proximity um, are going to enable us to use these kind of liquid democracy protocols also and, and surfing, surfacing social leadership in a scale that um, we haven't seen before. Um, it's interesting. It sounds a little bit like Malka Older's Infomocracy, and I know she's yeah. speaking oh, yeah. tomorrow morning, so definitely come. She's the first talk in the morning. Um, so uh, the next top voted question by from Anonymous. The registering uh, birth. <laughs> yeah, registering a birth on the blockchain. It's yeah. fascinating. What's yeah. the objective? So we call her a blockchain baby. Uh, <laughs> 
and there's a video online, and I'm gonna regret I told you this because it's like two <laughs> days after I gave birth, and I'm in like a you know blue. Oh God, don't even tell me. But it's there. If you wanna see it. Um, <laughs> but essentially, what we wanted to prove was that um, if the United States disappears as a as a construct, or if California disappears as a construct, which is what it is, it's an we believe in the idea of the United States. Mm -hmm. We believe in the idea of countries. They're not a physical, they, they don't really exist as such. We believe that they're an institution that exists. And they haven't been here forever, so there's no reason to believe they're gonna be here forever. So um, what we wanted to do was to say, this, some, this event, Roma's birth, took place at this point in time. And we're appending this to this ledger that it's an append-only ledger, so it's uncorruptible. You can't go back and change that information. Mm -hmm. So the idea was like showing that there is a way to give ourselves an identity and say, like, this happened. This, this girl was born here. And I don't care if the state of California tomorrow goes crazy and, you know, um, it's that her birth certificate doesn't, you know, um, have it's any influence. It's, it's there. And it's going to be there. Um, so yeah, blockchain baby. Let's, uh, so we have one more question. I think it's really interesting. Um, how do we create new models that are accessible to all without depending on technology that's inaccessible like blockchain? And I think a follow-up question that I had to mm. that is like, what are the institutions that are monitoring and controlling these blockchains, right? Like, you know, there's electricity that needs to be made. There are corporations, you know, there's a question of that authoritarian technique, so to speak. <laughs> Well, the idea of blockchain is that it doesn't have a central authority. So the, sure. the question is no one. The answer is yeah. no one. But like, the, no one is monitoring. There's a, there's a, no. no, I interrupted yeah. it. No, 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 no. I guess the question is, like, so how do you have access to blockchain if you don't have access to technology? And also, yeah. blockchain itself is a very highly energy intensive yeah. product. So you do need power plants, yeah. and people need to control those power plants. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so there's some questions about uh, what flows out of that to make blockchain accessible. But then also, like, how do you get those people online and access? Yeah, no, absolutely. Right? Um, again, this is, um, you know, when, when I'm talking about energy, when, um, the whole conversation about renewable energy, at least at the beginning, now I think that changed a little bit. But there was that idea that solar is going to replace fuel, you know, or wind power is going to replace. Like one thing was going to replace. I don't think that's the case. It's more likely a combination of different things. So I don't think that like when paradigms shift, it's not like one disappears and the other one takes over, right? Like yeah. we we transition um, from one to the other one. So um, so what we I mean, these ideas that I'm presenting are ideas or, or things to build in the next 50 years or 100 years. I don't think it's something that it's gonna, this is not a form of government that is going to replace government today. Right? I do think that we need to build a new model, and we need to experiment with that, and we need to try, and we need to fail, and we need to learn from it. Um, so we are in the learning process, essentially. So on the blockchain question, um, access to technology is obviously not only important for this, but it's important for everything. Yeah. So it's something that we should still strive for and, and fight for and uh, try to bring um, everyone in the world um, connected. Yeah. Um, so that's obviously a key part of that. And then on the energy side of it, I think that if anything, the, at least the Bitcoin block, blockchain is a bounty on uh, the cheapest sort of energy in the sense of the, the freest sort of energy. Mm. Like the, when we can start mining um, that blockchain with alternative energies, like the cost of that is going to be zero or very, very, very low. So I think, if anything, it's a huge bounty into sort of investing in this type of alternative energies instead of using. Um, so that's one aspect. And the other aspect of it is that at least it's measured. Yeah. If you know how much money the, it's uh, how much energy it costs to um, maintain the Bitcoin blockchain. It's, a, it's great. Do you know how much energy it costs to support the US dollar? No, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, this is a, these are really great questions and a whole new reason for me to invest in renewable energy. Yeah, I think. Exactly. <laughs> and Bitcoin, but yeah, I just and say Bitcoin that. Too. <laughs>